And now, good morning once again. So today, we'll, we'll be discussing state responsibility, which is a key topic in any course of public international law. You will see the, uh, the lecture will consist of two parts because it is voluminous. Uh, it is quite detailed. And you may have noticed that every new lecture is more detailed and more complicated in, in a way than the previous one. That was, that was exactly the idea. The, come on, it doesn't work. The good news about this class is that you will be asked to make yourselves familiar with one document, mainly. So, this document is called Draft Articles on Responsibility of States for Internationally Wrongful Acts. This document was developed and adopted by the International Law Commission in 2001 and was submitted to the General Assembly of the United Nations for approval. It was adopted by the General Assembly on the 12th of December 2001. One slide back. Yep. The good news is that you will have to study this one document. Plus, of course, all the international legal doctrine that you will be able to find in addition to it. In the handouts that I gave you, you will find a full text of the articles, plus an official commentary, uh, article by article, on this document produced by the International Law Commission. So the International Law Commission did not just produce the articles, but it also produced an article by article commentary to them. Uh, you will see that the commentary contains, is very detailed, it explains every single provision in the text. <coughs> it also provides useful uh, examples, references to case law, references to academic literature on this matter. So uh, just be sure that the very minimum that you will do on this subject is to read and study 300 pages of, uh, of the articles with the commentary. If you go beyond that and study some, some textbooks, that will be even better. The articles consist of 59 articles. Uh, the, the, the document is structured in two parts. Part one is entitled The Internationally Wrongful Act of a State. And you will see this is the key notion in, in this text. Uh, you will be asked to study very thoroughly what the internationally wrongful act of a state is, what it means, what its constituent elements are, why they matter, and how they are interrelated. And part two relates to the implementation of the international responsibility of a state. That is, in part two, it is explained what happens when the existence of an internationally wrongful act has been established, and what the consequences of, of such an act are. <coughs> For the rest of the class, we'll go through the text of the document and we'll look at some of its main provisions so that at the end of the class, uh, you should have an overall comprehensive picture of what the international responsibility of a state is about. So let's begin with the, from the very beginning, from Article 1. Article 1 lays down the main rule to the effect that every internationally wrongful act of a state entails the international responsibility of that state. That's the rule of the rules. If any state violates any rule of international law, the international responsibility of that state should arise. That is what this article is about. 
please note that the provision does not say that an, an internationally wrongful act of a state entails the international responsibility of that state. No. The International Law Commission, in drafting this article, emphasized that every, every single internationally wrongful act of a state entails it, its international responsibility. So, this provision is fundamental in emphasizing that the responsibility of a state under international law is a matter to be, to be taken seriously and that all the subsequent provisions explain how exactly this mechanism works. Mm -hmm. What is then an internationally wrongful act? An internationally wrongful act is another way, so it's, it is an international legal way to refer to a violation of international law. An internationally wrongful act consists of two elements. It can be an action or a mission. That is, it can be a proactive thing that a state does, or else it can be a failure by a state to act in a situation when, when the state is required to act under international law. And such action or omission must be attributable to the state in question. And second, such an action or omission must constitute a breach of an international obligation of the state in question. How, how do you understand the phrase that an action or omission is attributable to a state? How do you imagine that? Exactly. Means that an action or a mission was committed by that state. How do we know that an action or, or a mission was committed by a state? How do we know it? It has to be done by its uh, authority or <coughs> government mm -hmm. or others or by its direction and some financial support. Mm -hmm. so this is established. Thank you, exactly. We know that an action or a mission is attributable to a state under international law, first of all, if it was committed by any organ of the state in question. And this is where we have to remember something from our first class. You remember that one of the elements of statehood is the government or a public authority within a state that is constituted of the legislative, executive, and judicial branches of, uh, of public power. So if any organ of the state carrying out the state's legislative, executive, or judicial function commits uh, any action or omission, that, is, that action or omission should be attributable to the state as, as a whole. There are also some other situations in which actions or omissions are attributable to the state, and we'll, we'll have a look at them in, uh, in a couple of minutes. Secondly, the action or omission in question must constitute a breach of an international obligation of the state in question. <clears throat> What is an international obligation of a state? Does anyone else have an answer? Let's, indeed, let's wake up everyone. So what is an international obligation? The international obligation is the one that is undertaken by the state um, under the rules <coughs> that it has ratified or that it has Obligation under other sources of international law, such as general principles of law and the 
the words of Erdo Open. So uh, we believe that uh, the international obligation can be, find, can be found in any source of international law. Thank you. That's beautiful. Indeed, international obligations of states derive from any applicable sources of, uh, of international law. Uh, from all those that you have listed and also from international custom. And so, in order for, <clears throat> in order for an internationally wrongful act of a state to be there, uh, the action or a mission of a state in question must not be in conformity with its international obligations under treaty law, under custom or international law, under Bus Coggins, under any other source of international law that applies to that particular legal relationship. We say that an act is internationally wrongful if the, if the act is governed by international law. So the draft articles on responsibility of states are not concerned with uh, violations of the municipal law of states. They're concerned with violations of international law by states and uh, therefore they are limited in substance to international law only. It may happen that one and the same act committed by a state may be lawful under its domestic law and unlawful under international law. <clears throat> so, in such situations, the international responsibility of a state should nonetheless be invoked because a state, while believing that it's acting lawfully under its domestic law, might in fact at the same time be violating a rule a treaty-based one or a customary one, or even a peremptory norm of general international law. Uh, so it may be committing an act that is prohibited by international law. Can you think of an example of such a situation? When could a state possibly believe that it's acting lawfully under its domestic law, but at the same time be in violation of international law? <coughs> Yes, please. Um, probably when, for example, the international treaty it, it came before the part uh, of the national legal system, and after that, the domestic laws they were changed or the the new ones were adopted, mm -hmm. and the state might claim that the new adopted domestic laws they violate uh, they, they they in accordance with them. The, the act is absolutely lawful, while at the same time it has no legal grounding because still the state should adhere to the international law uh, mm -hmm. in contrary to the domestic legal system. To be more specific, it uh, may happen that the state, after a treaty enters into force for it, changes its mind about the treaty and for some reason decides not, not to comply with the treaty anymore without formally denouncing it. Because sometimes denouncing a treaty might not be good for the image of the state. So the state may decide to deviate from a treaty as a matter of fact uh, and also as a matter of, of its domestic law, without formally denouncing it. So, uh, a good example could be the non-compliance by a state, for example, with decisions by the European Court of Human Rights against that state. Uh, because the constitutional provisions of the state seemingly allow the state sometimes not to comply with such decisions. So, domestically, uh, the situation 
could be okay, but internationally this would be a violation of European human rights law because the European Convention on Human Rights requires every state party to it to comply with the decisions of the European Court of Human Rights. <coughs> Article 4 is about what we said a couple of minutes ago. It says, the conduct of any state organ shall be considered an act of that state under international law, whether the organ exercises legislative, executive, judicial, or any other functions, whatever position it holds in the organization of the state, and whatever its character as an organ of the central government or of a territorial unit of the state. You see, the, the provision is very comprehensive. Any state organ, be it central or local, be it legislative, executive or judicial, be it uh, in the capital or in a region of a country, performing whatever function in the state system, represents the state. No state official ever acts in his or her personal capacity while in office. Anything that a state official does or says in his or her official capacity is attributable to a state. To be more specific, uh, if a national parliament adopts a law that conflicts with the state's obligations under international law, the parliament commits a violation of international law that is, that is attributable to, to, to the state as a whole. Example, the, the law of the World Trade Organization obliges member states of the WTO to adapt the domestic laws to the law of the WTO. If a national parliament adopts a law that contravenes, uh, for example, the GATT, the General Agree Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, this would be a violation of that state's international obligations under the GATT. If a judge, in issuing a verdict, invokes, for example, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, but applies the covenant in an improper way, interprets a provision in the covenant incorrectly, or else does not take into account a provision in the covenant that should have been taken into account in order to decide the, the merits of the case uh, correctly. That judge commits a violation of international law, but that violation is attributed to, to the state as a whole, and what happens then? The injured party may file an appeal with a superior court if the appeal is lost and thereby the domestic remedies are exhausted. The injured party could apply to, uh, to a relevant international judicial or expert body and the, the state as a whole would be a respondent before that international judicial or expert body, when the case reaches it. Article 7 is about the consequences of an act or, or a mission uh, that is committed in contravention of instructions. Can you think of an example uh, of a violation of international law that is committed in violations of instructions that uh, should guide the or an organ of a state? Can you think of such an example? While you're thinking, let me uh, draw your attention to some key elements here. The conduct of an organ of a state shall be considered an act of the state under international law if the organ, person or entity acts in that capacity 
even if it, even if it exceeds its authority or contravenes instructions. That is, uh, whenever a state organ performs its duties, we assume that uh, the organ works within the limits of the law, within the framework of applicable law. But it may well happen that individuals acting as organs of states abuse their power. So for that, under domestic criminal law, there is individual criminal responsibility, uh, responsibility for the abuse of authority. Certainly, criminal responsibility of an individual in question may arise under a state's domestic law, but under international law, the act or omission in question is nonetheless attributable to the state in question, and the international responsibility of the state should arise. So, can you think of, of an example that could, work, that could illustrate this, this provision? Well, I think that the standard example that we can bring is that, for example, the president currently of uh, the Russian Federation, mm -hmm. he acts in his capacity as the commander of the armed forces, mm -hmm and as the person who defines the foreign policy of the state. And so basically he acts just uh, in that capacity, but he exceeds its authority or contravenes the instructions that, um, basically the, uh, the instructions that are equal to the obligation undertaken under the UN Charter that to promote international peace and to contribute to international peace. And I suppose that probably this, this is... Mm -hmm. That's a, that's a specific example of a uh, more general one, probably, that is related to the commission of crimes under international law that could be committed by, a, by state officials of any level, from the head of a state to the commander of a military unit or even to a serviceman in a, uh, in a military unit. Actually, the military instructions of uh, any state uh, instruct soldiers and officers to comply with international humanitarian law. Certainly, if a soldier or an officer violates international humanitarian law, that would be an excess of instructions. And so, uh, in such a case, the individual in question uh, would be liable criminally under applicable domestic and probably international criminal law, uh, but the action of a soldier, of an officer, because it is attributable to the state as a whole, should also entail the international responsibility of the state in question. Uh, this provision is contained in the Hague Regulations uh, on the laws and customs of war on land and has, uh, since their adoption, become a rule of customary international law. <coughs> Article 8 is about conduct directed or controlled by a state. See, this article is already not about the actions or omissions of organs of a state, but it's about actions or omissions of, of a person, a group of persons, uh, that in fact, are acting on the instructions of or under the direction or control of the state in question. And in such a case, if this happens, the act, the action or omission in question is, in fact, to be attributed to the state as a whole. Examples? Yes, please. Well, I I guess that uh, the example can be Nicaragua case uh, when uh, contracts were not acting exactly under instructions of uh, U.S. soldiers and <coughs> under instructions of U.S. parliament and government, and there was no violation according to the Nicaragua case. Am I right or not? The example is good in that. <coughs> Uh, in that, in, uh, especially in armed conflicts, it happens rather infrequently that armed groups receive support from foreign states and inasmuch as 
financial, military, economic, ideological support received from a foreign state is conveyed, is made material in the actions of these groups. In other words, in as much as the policy of a foreign state that provides support to an armed group is materialized in the actions of that group, uh, it may be argued that the actions or omissions which are committed, in fact, by those groups are to be attributed to the state that supports them because it may be argued that without that support, the group in question might not, but might not be able to act. Uh, so the, the example that you gave, I think, is, is good. Or other applicable examples that pertain to Ukraine are the so-called DNR and LNR. You had just mentioned D DNR and LNR, and I wanted to stress the role of Russia in this conflict. So Russia uh, controls, like, uh, to my mind, Russia controls um, those people uh, on the east, in the eastern part of Ukraine, and without their support, um, those countries won't be able to conduct such actions as they conduct right now mm -hmm. and continue to do that, have continued to do that starting from 2013-14. So this is a real example that is happening right now. That's it. <laughs> <coughs> Related to the previous article is Article 10. It's about conduct of an insurrectional or other movement. What happens if the acts committed by an insurrectional movement, that is, by any sort of rebels, insurgents, fighters, violate international law, and as a result of the struggle, either the insurrectional movement becomes a new government of the state in question, or else an entire new state is established. The International Law Commission's articles on state responsibility provide clear answers to these questions. If an insurrectional movement that, in the course of their struggle, commits violations of international law, replaces the government within a state and becomes a new government, then the actions of the, the previous actions of the insurrectional movement are to be regarded as an act of, of that state. And the new government has to, be, uh, has to be called to responsibility or the responsibility of the new government for its previous actions has to be invoked. On the other hand, if such an insurrectional or other similar movement that seeks to separate itself from the mother state succeeds in doing so, then the acts of the movement before separation are to be regarded as an act of the new state under international law, and consequently the responsibility of the new state is to be, has to be invoked. And Article 12 is key. <clears throat> How do we establish the existence of a breach of an international obligation? We say that there is a breach of an international obligation of a state when we prove that an act of the state in question is not in conformity with what is required of it by that obligation. That is, whenever we invoke the international responsibility of a state, we we'll have to find a rule of international law that applies to the regulation of the state's conduct. We we'll have to single out from that rule the rights and obligations of the state under international law. And we we'll have to show 
which obligations under international law have not been complied with. Well, it may be easier, the task may be easier uh, if an obligation in question is embodied in a treaty. You just have to look into the treaty, find an applicable provision, and <clears throat> well, and see to which extent the state has acted in accordance with the provision in question. Yet, if the conduct of a state is regulated allegedly by, by a rule of custom or international law, the task could be somewhat more complex. Let me ask you where exactly in which actions, in which, uh, well, I want to say sources, but these are not exactly sources. Where do we find evidence? Yeah, that would be a good, uh, a good, uh, good way to ask the question. Where exactly do we find evidence of customary international law? How do we know that the rule of customary international law exists? We say that a rule of customary international law consists of state practice plus opinio juris. So, where exactly do we have to look for state practice? What does it consist of? Yes, please. Uh, the state practice we can find, for example, is concerned about uh, the humanitarian law in the manuals, instructions of the states, and opinion reviews we, we, we may find found in, uh, for example, the statements of the authorities, mm -hmm. and uh, in uh, such and other documents uh, in uh, states. Uh, <coughs> in general uh, amount of states, so mm -hmm. it's uh, maybe another kind of documents, for example, manuals, instructions, and it's uh, another kind of mm -hmm. Thank you. You have also mentioned domestic law. Uh, so does, does this mean that the, the domestic law of a state testifies to its state practice? Do you mean this? Actually, uh, I didn't mean it at all, but, uh, but I mean that uh, if uh, in the general knowledge of states uh, the same practice, uh, regular, uh, for example, for the regulation of uh, the non international army conflict that such as, so it may constitute the international custom of the law, mm -hmm. too, maybe. Thank you. No, the, uh, the answer is very good. The practice of states uh, is to be found in whatever official state practice, be it domestic legislation, be it statements on behalf of the state at various international fora, for example, at international conferences. It can be found in uh, the diplomatic correspondence, in statements made in the press on behalf of a state. State practice can be found in uh, anything that the head of a state or a government or a foreign minister says or does. State practice is about anything said or done in, in an official capacity by any state organ. State practice is about various military manuals that could could be applicable in a state. Uh, state practice is about decisions made by domestic courts. Interestingly, and this is interesting indeed, decisions made by international courts, you remember, are not a source of international law. They are a subsidiary means for the determination of rules of international law. But decisions made by domestic courts, if they testify <clears throat> to the existence of a pattern of uh, uniform practice by states on a matter, so decisions made by domestic courts, they do testify to the existence of customary international law. That's an interesting paradox. International courts do not create international law. They interpret it and clarify it and contribute to its development. However, domestic courts, because um, their decisions are reflective of official positions of states, they do contribute to the formation 
uh, modification or termination of, of customary rules of international law. <clears throat> and very importantly, whenever we invoke an international obligation of a state and we allege that it has been violated, we have to be sure to prove that at the time an act in question was committed, the obligation was in force for that state. How do we know that a, an obligation under a treaty is in force for a state in question? It was signed or ratified <coughs> by two states. So uh, there was an uh, approved, a written proof that it is, it is in force. So it was signed or ratified, and that's enough. Uh, if it is a customary law. No, uh, let's talk about treaties for the time being. For treaties, if it is signed or ratified, from my point of view, mm -hmm. uh, it it will be enough. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think that the issue of the first one is actual, so states still are members and still are parties of one treaty and still mm -hmm. share obligations and rights. Thank you. So here's already an additional element. An obligation is enforced when a state is a party to a treaty. That's somewhat different from signing or ratifying it. <clears throat> I wanted to add a specific point maybe that sometimes states can sign, uh, but they don't have to ratify mm -hmm. this treaty. And uh, for example, it, uh, it is not actually a party to this treaty. Uh, and, uh, if this state commits uh, a violation, <coughs> it, is, uh, it is not a party to a treaty, so in fact it didn't or it does not uh, break this mm -hmm. obligation because mm -hmm. it is not bound by it, because it is not a party to a treaty. Good point. Some treaties require ratification in order for them to enter into force. So if a state signs the treaty but would not, would not yet ratify it, the obligation under the treaty would not yet be enforced for the state in question, but in accordance with the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, such a state would still be bound not to defeat the object or purpose of that treaty. That's, that has to be borne in mind. Let me approach to the gentleman. I wanted to say what mm. you said, that there, uh, even if the state has not ratified the treaty, but it has uh, signed it, it has, it has the obligation, and this obligation is not to violate the object and purpose of that treaty. Mm -hmm. So, in such a scenario, it is crucial to establish what the object or purpose of a given treaty are. So even, even in sometimes when a treaty has not entered into force for a state, the violation of its object or purpose could be invoked, but there the challenge would be to show exactly what the, what the object and purpose of a treaty is about. I believe that um, even if the state is not, is not a party to the international treaty, but if in the customary, if the rule that is within the particular article of this treaty considered to be the customary international law, mm -hmm. it still, um, the, 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 this, the state still has to comply with this rule because mm -hmm. it is considered, this, uh, this particular article will be considered as the international custom. Thank you. That's a beautiful transition to the second part of our discussion of this question. How do we, uh, yeah, we have said that uh, we can establish the existence of a rule of customer international law on the basis of state practice that is to be found in national laws, statements made by, by, by state officials, uh, in uh, statements found to be found in the official correspondence, in various manuals, etc., etc. So if we find that there is a uniform state practice on a matter of international law, 
we can surely invoke uh, this rule as one of customary international law. If a state acts inconsistently with a rule of customary international law, uh, it potentially violates the rule, uh, save in the case of uh, the persistent objector. You remember, we, uh, we mentioned this, this exception in, uh, in a previous class. In no case may a state uh, breach a rule of use cogens, though, because rules of use cogens are superior, they are peremptory, they allow for no derogations at all, uh, under no justifications whatsoever. So never could a state claim to be in the right if it, com uh, if it commits torture. Never could a state claim to be in the right if on its territory people are enslaved. Never could a state claim to be in the right if it commits an act of aggression against another state. Of course, in the scenarios pertaining to the use of force, uh, legitimate and lawful justifications can be invoked, such as, uh, such as self-defense. Uh, but uh, invoking self-defense is not, is not that easy. Well, uh, you will have to be dealing with a scenario like that in, uh, in your case study. Probably one more, uh, one more thing has to be mentioned on the relationship between uh, treaties and rules of customary international law as far as obligations under these two are concerned. Uh, indeed, it may happen that a state uh, denounces a treaty uh, because it wants to terminate its obligation under the treaty. If, the rule, if a rule or rules contained in that treaty also constitute customary international law, and that is important, the, uh, the denunciation of a treaty would not free the state from its obligation under customary international law. The most obvious example are the Geneva Conventions for the Protection of Victims of War. Now the Geneva Conventions are among the most widely ratified treaties in the world. Uh, theoretically, it is not impossible that a state may want to denounce the Geneva Conventions, but such a denunciation would not free the state from uh, its customary obligations to protect the victims of war because the Geneva Conventions have, since their adoption, acquired the character of customary international law. That's the end of the first part. Do you have questions on this part? Oh, yes, and then I'll, then I'll come to you. Thank you. Do you have an answer to this question, ladies and gentlemen of international law? Huh. I will complicate your lives. Please have a look into the commentaries to the draft articles. That will be more interesting. Um, I have a question concerning Article 8 of mm -hmm. the Articles on Responsibilities of State, and there it is stated that the uh, non-state actors should um, uh, commit some actions under instructions, directions, or control, and I'm wondering whether there is a distinction between those three notions. There is a distinction. The distinction is outlined in the, uh, in the commentary. Uh, to, uh, to that article. Let me also encourage all of you to, to read the comments. I will, now I will limit myself to, to saying, in order to make it even more interesting for you, 
that uh, even the notion of control has at least two levels. There can be an overall control and there can be an effective control. So please take your time this evening, tonight, to at least go through those commentaries. You will see it's a fascinating document. Of course, you will not be able to, or maybe some of you will, who knows, to, to read 300 pages in, in just one evening. Uh, but you will, have, you will have enough time until the competition anyway. Uh, it is my friendly advice that you read the document really thoroughly because the competition during the competition, the, the articles on state responsibility will be invoked more than once, more than once. Let me put on the next presentation and we'll continue in two minutes. Gentlemen, let's continue. Before we proceed with the second part of the presentation, let me uh, mention one important thing that uh, some of you discussed with me now during the break. It concerns the, the status and uh, title of uh, the document that we're discussing now. Formally, the, the document is called Draft Articles on Responsibility of States for Internationally Wrongful Acts. But uh, it has been increasingly referred to as simply articles without the draft part. And so the, the question arises as to the proper title and to the status of this document. The, those who emphasize the draft aspect in the title say, well, this is, this is doctrine. This is doctrine that was produced by the International Law Commission as authoritative as the Commission is, but still it is doctrine. And because these articles have not yet been embodied in a treaty, in a binding source of written international law, they should remain to be referred to as draft articles. However, others, such as Professor Lukashuk, who wrote uh, a book on the law of state responsibility, highlight a different issue, and uh, I tend to support this one. This document reflects customary international law. So not the commentaries, but the articles themselves. The articles are a representative codification of customary international law. <coughs> and in that sense, because the text of the articles reproduces the, the rules of customary international law, the text may and should be referred simply as articles on responsibility of states for internationally wrongful acts because what matters for the determination of the status of this rule is not so much the, the status of the body that codified them. Uh, although, of course, the Commission consists of uh, uh, renowned experts on international law. What matters is the customary nature of those provisions. So because the text uh, reproduces customary rules of international law, uh, the, document, the document may be referred simply as articles on responsibility of states for internationally wrongful acts, uh, also given the fact that the articles were adopted by the General Assembly and by virtue of that they received recognition from the, from the community of states. So, having said that, let us proceed to the second part of, uh, uh, of the presentation. Article 30 lays down the consequences of the establishment of the existence of an internationally wrongful act. In other words, once it has been established that a state has breached its, uh, its obligation under international law, two consequences arise. <clears throat> the state must seize the act that violates international law if that act continues, 
or else, uh, if circumstances so require, the state has to offer appropriate assurances of non-repetition of the violation. If the nature of an act was such that it was quick, not lasting, then the state has to assure the victim state of uh, its intention not to repeat the violation of international law, or else if the nature of an act in question is such that it continues at its lasting, then it must be seized. <coughs> Essentially, the most important, the most significant consequence of uh, the establishment or of the determination of the existence of an international, uh, internationally wrongful act is reparation. Reparation is a, is a collective title for, for a number of more specific consequences that uh, make up the content of an international responsibility of a state. Uh, reparation means that the responsible state has to cover all damages, whether material or moral, caused by the internationally wrongful acts of the state in question. In other words, reparation are measures that a state that has violated international law has to take in order to make good as far as possible for the material or moral damage caused by its violation of international law. Article 32 recalls once again that the provisions of a state's internal law are no justification for, the, uh, for a state's failure to comply with its obligations under, under the Articles. So, a state may not invoke rules of its domestic law to justify its violation of international law. In accordance with Article 34, there are three single forms of reparation that can be used either singly, independently, or in any combination between them. They're called restitution, compensation, and satisfaction. What is restitution? Yes, please. Uh, restitution is uh, an act uh, in order to return the international situation that occurred before the breach of international obligation um, to the previous state of actions. Beautiful. Uh, one of the purposes of this, of this exercise is that uh, during the competition, judges will be asking you exactly these questions. So, uh, it's, it's fantastic that, that already now you are trying to put into your own words what you know about international law. Your answer is absolutely correct. Restitution is about the re-establishment of the situation that existed before the commission of an, of an internationally wrongful act. That is, whenever possible, a state that injured another state by having committed an internationally wrongful act has to roll back the situation, so to say, to, the, to a previous state of affairs, to, to, to a status quo, uh, so that the, the situation becomes as if nothing happened. Is this always possible? No. Why? Uh, okay, I think uh, when uh, people were killed, you cannot uh, return it 
Mm -hmm. uh, it would be also very difficult if uh, the damage was very significant to mm -hmm. return to the situation which was before. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Indeed, if people die, they cannot be made alive again. Uh, if people are tortured, uh, bruises on their bodies cannot, be, cannot probably be healed. If damage to the environment is caused by, by hostilities, uh, sometimes it is irrevocable. Sometimes uh, soil or water or air can be damaged irreparably or else uh, it can be so severe that its consequences could be felt over the decades. So, the pre-existing situation, the situation that had existed before a violation of international law, cannot always be restored. It, can, it may not always be established. So restitution is not always possible. I agree with that and want to add that uh, there are there is a number there is a huge number of situations when restitution is not possible and you uh, named that, the name that named them just and I wanted to specify that for example in the case where Chernobyl catastrophe mm -hmm. uh, compensation <coughs> is applicable because restitution is impossible mm -hmm. so uh, and it is uh, actually very hard sometimes to define uh, both those criteria. Uh, of impossibleness and the second criteria of restitution so that uh, it goes to compensation and satisfaction. But mm -hmm. is, uh, is satisfaction, uh, I want to ask, mm -hmm. if uh, satisfaction is a kind of uh, non-repetition, uh, non like, mm -hmm. uh, and apologize for Thank you for the question. We'll come to satisfaction in a couple of minutes. Uh, let's now discuss compensation first. Certainly, compensation was, was and is applicable in the Chernobyl scenario with a reservation that it's about compensation under civil law. Uh, the Chernobyl scenario is not about international law. It is not about a breach of a state's international obligation. It was a, uh, uh, was a catastrophe that occurred within, within one state and it did not involve a breach of international law by any state. But the term employed, compensation, is the same as in civil law. So, compensation is about uh, assessing the damage that resulted from a violation of international law and compensating for the damage, that is paying, paying, for, uh, paying for the damage to be assessed in monetary terms insofar as it cannot be made good by, uh, by restitution. And importantly, compensation also may include the loss of profits insofar as it is established. Mm. Is compensation an, an adequate modality? Yes, please. Uh, the question is, do you consider compensation an adequate measure? Uh, let me give you an example. Uh, sometimes states uh, pay compensation for, for the loss of human lives in, in hostilities. Is compensation adequate in, in such cases? Can, can a human life be compensated for? Maybe it's adequate, but it's not enough. Money won't change a person nowhere and never. But I don't know, it won't be right from that state that one injury to respond with the same acts and to kill those citizens of the other state. So I think it has to be regulated somehow otherwise. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You see, there's, there's a moral issue about this, about this act of a state. Uh, it's, it's customary for states to uh, 
to offer compensation if they acknowledge a breach of international law that they have committed. But in moral terms, compensation is not always adequate. It, it simply cannot cover uh, some damages that, that were inflicted, that were caused. Inasmuch as restitution cannot sometimes uh, bring back the situation that had, that had existed before the violation of international law, compensation sometimes cannot, uh, cannot be an adequate means for, uh, to assess the, and to make good for the damage caused. And finally, satisfaction. Satisfaction means an acknowledgement of the breach, an expression of regret, a formal apology, or another appropriate modality. In that sense, because this list is, is open, uh, satisfaction could also include an assurance of non-repetition of, uh, of a violation. In, uh, in other words, uh, if compensation is about money, satisfaction is a political act uh, whereby a state acknowledges that it has indeed committed a violation of international law. Uh, it may include an apology, it may include an assurance of no repetition, it may include a regret, in other words, it may include, it may be about any official statement by a state uh, to, the, to the effect of acknowledging its, its guilt. Can you think of any historical examples of satisfaction? Um, let me now come here. Can you, can you re re uh, recall any examples whereby states expressed satisfaction? Yes. If I'm not mistaken, there is such example in the Rainbow Warrior case mm -hmm. where their <coughs> friend uh, formally apologized for that uh, the friends for that friends uh, destroyed their Greenpeace ship and mm -hmm. Thank you. Good example. Uh, any other examples? Another example would be uh, the apologies offered by Germany uh, after the Second World War. Germany, the, the new German state that was founded in 1949, uh, acknowledged the, the guilt of its predecessor state of Nazi Germany for many crimes committed before and during the Second World War, and compensation was offered to the victims and to the families of victims of, uh, of such numerous crimes. As much as compensation could not, could not make good uh, for, the, for the losses of millions of lives that happened before and during the Second World War, as much as compensation could not, could not be adequate at all to match the, the degree of suffering that was, uh, that was inflicted upon, upon the victims of that war, well, Germany nonetheless offered both satisfaction and compensation to other states and to, uh, and to natural persons who, were, who had been victims to the Nazi atrocities. An opposite example of uh, satisfaction having not been offered, well, could be the position of Turkey on the question of, uh, of the genocide of Armenians during the First World War. You know that in Turkey there is, uh, in Turkey's criminal code, there is an article criminalizing the insult of Turkishness, that's what it's called, uh, attempt to, to raise the question of, of, of the genocide of Armenians often fall under this very article, and Turkey uh, did not yet officially acknowledge uh, the role of the Ottoman Empire 
in the, in the genocide of its Armenian population. Now we're moving to a very important section in, the, uh, in part two of the articles on state responsibility. This section is about the invocation of responsibility for violations of peremptory norms of general international law. Before moving here, uh, let me draw your attention to another point. Most of the time, the international responsibility of a state is invoked on a bilateral basis. That is, uh, or rather, not exactly, not exactly on a bilateral basis, but uh, within international, most of the time, international responsibility of a state is invoked among a closed, a limited number of states. Example, if a bilateral treaty is violated, and that's why I refer to a uh, bilateral rela uh, relationship, uh, then the victim state, the victim of a violation of international law, simply addresses its counterpart and says, hey, you have violated a rule of international law. So, then it's up to the victim to invoke the, uh, a violation of international law. If it's, a, if it's a multilateral treaty, then as a rule, it's also the injured state, probably with some other states that invoke the responsibility of the guilty state. This is not exactly the case when a peremptory norm of general international law is violated. The violation of a rule of use cogens is about a gross or systematic failure. So please pay attention to, uh, to these dual criteria. A gross or systematic failure by the responsible state to fulfill the obligation under use cogens. And Article 40 and subsequent <coughs> sorry. Article 40 and subsequent articles apply to serious breaches of peremptory norms of general international law. If such, a if such a breach occurs, look how different the consequences are. If a simple breach of international law occurs, be it a rule of treaty law or of customary international law, then the injured state invokes the state responsibility with a violator state, and that's it. However, if a serious breach of a, of a use Kogan's norm happens, the consequences are different, they're particular. In accordance with paragraph 1 of Article 41, states should cooperate, so all states should cooperate to bring to an end, through lawful means, any serious breach within the meaning of Article 40. So it's not only, uh, if a rule of use cogens is violated, it's not only up to the victim state to invoke the responsibility of the violator, but all states must unite to bring, through lawful means, the violation to an end. That is why in March 2014, uh, most of the states uh, united themselves in the General Assembly to vote in support of Ukraine. Uh, by having adopted the resolution 262 because there happened a violation of a peremptory norm of general international law and most states of the world <coughs> have expressed their official position in support of the territorial integrity of Ukraine. No state should recognize in accordance with paragraph 2 of article 41 as lawful a situation created by a serious breach within the meaning of Article 40. 
That is why in the resolution 262, all states were called upon not to recognize the consequences of the so-called referendum, which took place on the 16th of March, 2014 in Crimea. No, and no state should render aid or assistance in maintaining that situation. And thirdly, <clears throat> this article is without prejudice to the other consequences referred to in this part and to other consequences that could be possible under international law. What does it mean? It means that in addition to the responsibility of a, uh, of a state for a violation of a use Kogan's norm, there may be other uh, legal consequences such as the individual criminal responsibility of uh, people who might have led their state to commit an internationally wrongful act. For example, uh, the, the individual criminal responsibility for aggression, for war crimes, for other crimes under international law. So, you see, the, the consequences of serious breaches of Euskogen's norms are very different from those entailed by simple violations of, uh, of international law. A simple violation of, an, of international law entails the, is invoked by the victim state, it is addressed directly to the violator state, and does not concern the other states, members of the, uh, of the international community. However, if a breach of a use Kogan's norm occurs, then all states must unite to stop the violation as soon as possible and not to recognize the consequences of such a violation. <clears throat> and in the final part of the, no, before we move to the final part of the class, do you have any questions about, uh, uh, about the legal consequences of serious breaches of use Kogan's norms? Then let us move to the final part of the, uh, of the lecture. It's about circumstances relieving a state from international responsibility. It may be that a state does, in fact, commit a violation of international law, but the violation happens in the circumstances that justify the, uh, the act or omission, or relieve the state from, uh, from, its inter from, from its responsibility under international law. These circumstances are all listed in the articles, and the first of such, of such circumstances is consent. <clears throat> if a state consents to the commission of an act or omission that formally constitutes a breach of international law, such consent precludes the wrongfulness of such an act or omission. Can you think of an example? Of an example of a state consenting to a violation of international law to be committed against itself, whereby such a consent would preclude the international responsibility of a state that is formally guilty. <clears throat> a good example would be uh, a mass influx of refugees from one state to another state. For, uh, imagine that Within a country, there is a violent conflict, and thousand, thousands of people want to flee from that conflict into another state. Uh, many of these people would have no documents because their houses have been burned. Uh, many of uh, these people would, would simply, well, these, sim these people would simply approach the international border between, between the two states and will, would flow into the territory of another state. Under the normal circumstances, this would be a criminal violation of, uh, of the law. Yet, 
if the state where the refugees are heading consents to their arrival for humanitarian reasons, this would not be a violation of its territorial integrity and of its international borders. Because the state would have said, yes, we are prepared to receive these, these people because they're fleeing to save, the, to, to save their lives. So, uh, such a consent would preclude the, the wrongfulness of, uh, of the act in question. Let's move on. Under Article 21, another circumstance precluding the, wrongfulness, the international wrongfulness of an act is self-defense. Because self-defense is a lawful measure taken in conformity with the Charter of the United Nations. How is self-defense understood in the context of the Charter of the United Nations? Can you recall in which article of the Charter of the UN? Ah, good. Um, article 51. Good, <laughs> exactly, it's Article 51. And now let me approach some of the people here to, to ask my previous question. How is self-defense understood in the context of uh, Article 51? Thank you. Do you all agree with this interpretation? When, when the, um, the question of the existence of the state is at stake. Uh -huh. Let's be more specific. Article 51 is about the use of force. Uh, the use of force as such is prohibited by the Charter of the United Nations. But if an armed attack occurs against a member of the United Nations, then the use of force in response to the armed attack is lawful. So, uh, a priori, the first use of force, of military force, I mean, is to be regarded as unlawful under the Charter of the United Nations. However, the use of force in response, in self-defense, if it is proportionate, if it corresponds to some other criteria laid down in international law, then it is lawful. By the way, uh, if you are interested in, in matters of self-defense, do, do some research or do some comparison of Article 51 of the, of the Charter of the United Nations in English, French, Russian, Spanish, and Chinese. You will see that there is a striking difference in uh, in this article, in the five authentic language versions of, uh, of the Charter. You will see that in, in at least some of the language versions of Article 51, the text is totally different. I'm not joking. Uh, at least the French text of Article 51 is, conveys a totally different meaning from the English, Russian, and Spanish texts. Do check it. You will be surprised. Yes, please. Mm -hmm. uh, if it is an act, uh, well, uh, it, uh, if there is, um, let me formulate. Uh, if there is an attack on the another state, and this state doesn't respond, so there is no self-defense. Can we say that uh, the war is an act of aggression? A priori, yes. Uh, because an act of aggression doesn't, should not necessarily uh, necessitate self-defense. If the victim state can, is weak, if it has no military capacity to resist the armed attack, if it understands that military resistance would only lead to multiple victims, and the state simply decides to accept the situation and to submit to the aggressor, certainly the act of aggression is a priori there. Uh, 
A good historical example would be Austria. When the Nazi troops uh, marched into Austria, uh, there, was not, there was not much of uh, military resistance to that Anschluss, as it's known in, the, uh, in history. Uh, but at the Nuremberg trial, uh, the Anschluss of Austria was regarded as an act of aggression committed by Nazi Germany, for sure. Article 22 is about countermeasures in respect of an internationally wrongful act. Oh. The article says that the wrongfulness of an act is precluded if and to the extent that the act constitutes a countermeasure taken against the, uh, the latter state. What are countermeasures? And which types of countermeasures do you know? Do you remember what reprisals are? Aha. Uh -huh. So, what are countermeasures and what are reprisals? Good. The very title, countermeasures, implies that these measures are taken to counter something, to uh, meet a challenge, to act against something. Countermeasures are measures that a state takes to stop the violations of international law committed by another state from happening. Uh, countermeasures are measures which would otherwise be unlawful, but because the other state is violating international law, the victim state also violates international law to stop the violator from that course of action. So, reprisal are one type of countermeasures. Please look it up in the textbooks of international law. Another common type of countermeasures are retortions. What's a retortion? Aha. Uh -huh. Please tell us about retortions and if possible give us an example of a retortion. Well, the retortions, if I'm not mistaken, they're uh, the measures which the state is uh, undertake. Uh, in the response of their uh, similar uh, measures uh, undertaken by their other state. Uh -huh. To be more specific, both reprisals and retortions are within the category of countermeasures. So both reprisals and retortions are taken in response to prior actions by another state. But the essential difference between them is that reprisals are formally unlawful actions taken in response to another state's unlawful actions. So, were it not for the other state's unlawful actions, a reprisal would also be unlawful. But because it's taken in response to an unlawful action, its wrongfulness is precluded. However, a retortion, they are very interesting. Retortions are formally lawful acts 
but which are unfriendly. A retortion is formally lawful, but it is unfriendly, unlike a reprisal, which is formally unlawful. A good example of a retortion would be <clears throat> the expulsion of diplomats of a foreign state. For instance, a state makes an unfriendly statement against, for instance, against Ukraine, and Ukraine, in response, decides to expel the diplomat who made the statement. Formally, the expulsion of a diplomat is a, uh, it's a lawful measure. The, the, uh, the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations allows to expel diplomats without, in, without indicating reasons for the expulsion. But it is an unfriendly act. Uh, formally, expelling a diplomat from a country is not a violation of international law. But nonetheless, it testifies to a complication between relation, uh, in relations between states, and it is unfriendly. Retortions are exactly this. Retortions are countermeasures which are formally lawful, but unfriendly. Force majeure. Force majeure is a term that you know very well from civil law. And it means more or less the same as in civil law. Force majeure is a circumstance precluding the wrongfulness of an act in as much as there is an occurrence of an irresistible force or an unforeseen event beyond the control of a state. And this force or this event prevents the state from complying with its obligation under international law. Can you think of an example of force majeure? That one is easy, very easy. Environmental disaster, These are the most typical examples of a force majeure. Floods, uh, tsunami, uh, eruptions of volcanoes, earthquakes, uh, so all those irresistible forces of nature that very surely could prevent a state from, uh, from complying with its international obligations. And that Article 24 is about distress. Distress means that the international responsibility of a state is precluded if the author of the act in question has no other reasonable way in a situation, in that situation of distress, of saving the author's life or the lives of other persons entrusted to the author's care. That is, uh, there can be situations which threaten the lives of people, and in order to save the lives of people, uh, it is decided to commit an act which, is, which formally is a violation of international law. Examples? Yes, please. Maybe I'm mistaken, but for example, if state decide to uh, protect the victims of terrorism from, for example, on territory of diplomatic uh, or another uh, territory of another state, maybe there is. Interesting example. Uh, it's to me it's uh, it borders uh, as it borders situations in which some states allege uh, there is a right to intervene in other states to save to save their nationals. Uh, a good example would be an Israeli intervention in Entebbe in the 1970s when a group of, uh, uh, of Israeli passengers were hijacked on, on a plane into, uh, into Uganda and uh, the Israelis intervened in, uh, in, that, in that country in order to save their nationals who were under a real, whose lives were under a real threat in those, in those circumstances. So that's an, uh, uh, that's an appropriate example. 